Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to be continuing with some attributes and scattering and I'm going to be showing you how to stick points to moving objects and if you haven't played around with moving objects and scattering you won't know that when you play uh, it basically just doesn't stick it, it will like randomize the point C to every frame, at least that's what it looks like. But I'm going to be showing you two methods of how to do uh, sticking to the first one I'm going to be showing you is slightly more accurate and the second one is a little more brute force but I'll be telling you why you might use one or the other. Um, so let's drop down a grid as we do and then I'm going to increase the points on this so we have a, a lot of detail after I put my mountain stop on here so we get a little bit of animation. Um, let's just make this not rough and very large scale. So you can see what's going on. And of course, I'll get rid of the grid and stuff. I click D there for the display options. So now if I put down a scatter and let's animate our time with dollar T. I explained this in another video. Um, I'll put, uh, put that in the card annotation. But as you can see now, I'll go in the top view. It's randomizing the seed every frame. It's basically regenerating points every time that this frame changes, which in most cases is not what you want. Um, I'll increase the points here, 3000 points. So the first method that we're going to be using is going to use a rest position. Now this node is extremely useful. Basically what it's going to do is it's going to create another attribute called rest. And this is the same, or when we put in another input, it will be the same as our position on the first frame. But basically it's going to create an attribute uh, that we can refer back to and this will allow us to use uh, something later to interpolate basically where stuff is moving. And then your points will know where to move to. So we're just going to be scattering essentially on the first frame and then no more. <laughs> um, but it's going to be moving with it like it's animating, if that made any sense. So now I'm going to be putting down a time shift which is an extremely useful node as well that I've not mentioned. And I'll show you what it does, uh, or some functions of it first. So normally the, what I use this for, to be honest with you, all the time is just, if I go up here, this has got an expression on it, so we click here and we'll see it's got $F in here. And what this frame box is doing is, whatever frame is displayed in this box is going to be, you know, whatever whatever's down here, because it's $F. But if I also change this to like minus one, then it's going to go a frame back. So we can put whatever frame we want in here and it will go to that frame in the animation. So what I did there was control shift and left mouse button to delete uh, the channels. Um, so this is what we're gonna be doing in this tutorial is setting it to one so we have the first frame always for our rest position. But another really useful way you can use this is you can actually slow down your simulations. So if I do uh, divide by 25, it's gonna be really nasty looking. But if we turn off integer frames, it's going to interpolate the motion between each frame. Now this is so, so useful because you can do like a cloth sim, a really heavy cloth sim and slow it down afterwards. Um, and all sorts of good stuff. It works on um, scattering points as well. Um, and then the other function it has is clamping. So if you've got a, a simulated piece of geometry that you've cached and it only goes to say frame 100, but you've got a sequence that goes to frame 200. After frame 100, it's gonna throw up an error saying, oh, I can't find frame 101, frame 102, etc." But clamping will basically set it so that after frame 100, it's just gonna freeze on the last frame and it's always gonna be frame 100 after that point. And similarly, before frame one in this case, it will just be frame one, so you won't get that error. Uh, but we're just gonna be looking at the frame box right now. And all I need to put in here is one. So we've got the first frame now, and I put that into the scatter. Actually, no, we don't. We don't put that into the scatter. We put that into our geometry, and then I put the second input as a time shift. Uh, and then if I enable my rest position, we've got our rest attribute here, which, like I said earlier, is going to be the same on the first frame. And this is what we're going to be referring to. It's never going to change because our time shift is always going to be set to one uh, and it's always going to be in the first frame and now what we do is we set our position with a pointer angle so we've got a little bit of x in here 
So we're setting our position attribute to our rest position attribute. And then what we're going to do is we're going to scatter. And you're like, well, that's not very useful. We're scattering on the first frame. That's cool. But we haven't got any animation in here. But what we need now is an attribute interpolate. And then what this attribute needs is it needs these two. And it's interpolating using your UV W, which is a really accurate way of, because each box has got its own. If you've ever seen like a UV map, it's like a color map, essentially lurping between two values. But if we just enable these two values, that's all we need to do to get these, this, uh, the set working. So the second input requires a source uh, which is going to be our rest. And there we go. We have our lovely interpolated geometry now. And it's really accurate as well. So the second way, which I was saying that is going to be using simulation, is a little bit more brute force. And I wouldn't recommend it for most things, but if you're using, for example, a uh, solver like a, a piece of geometry that is you know changing over time maybe like a bit of, of coral or something like that um, that is adding new bits of geometry sometimes this method can be a bit janky so what we can do is we can put down a pop net and i'm going to be using my scatter attribute as the source but we can also generate points within our pop net as well again uh, i'll be providing really useful links for uh, pop nets in the description below. Um, I just didn't want to cover uh, simulation and stuff like that in this series because it's already really widely covered for Houdini. I just wanted to be looking at like how I use Houdini as a normal 3D program. But the simulation side is something you should learn. Um, I'm just, you know, trying to teach another aspect of it, I guess. But you'll get a brief tutorial here. So if you jump in, you can see that we've got our guide and that's showing our geometry. Mm -hmm. My voice got a little weird. But we actually need to put this into our mountain sop. So now we go in here and we've got some geometry and it's doing the same thing. Every frame it's changing. So we, we're going to scatter onto all our points. And wait, what was that? Yeah, all our points. And then birth, we're going to set this to only emit on one frame. So we're going to do dollar $F equals one. So this is when $F, so when the frame equals one, it will emit. Any other frame, it's going to be zero, like so. And I'm going to turn off the guide. So as you can see, it's emitted on one frame and not moving. And that's because in a, inside a dot net, it's simulating. Or a pop net, sorry. Uh, which is a dot net. <laughs> it's so confusing. But essentially, a dot net is where you're going to do all your simulation. So what we need is we need to import the geometry and then I'm going to use a method called minpause which is an extremely useful function inside of X which allows you to look and see what the nearest point is and then drag a point to it. Probably could have explained that better. So if I put that into mountain, the second input, we're going to be referring to our second input using a point wrangle. Drop that here we can put tons of stuff here. We could put a, a pop force. Uh, I know I said I wouldn't talk about simulation, but just so you get your sort of start and you can see what it does. You turn up the amplitude and you get a bit of noise, that sort of stuff. But we're using it in a completely different way. And then here, what we need is we need an input. So input one is going to be our second context geometry which is our mountain salt, which is animating. And we're going to sort of interpolate inside of here using minpause. So if I go into the code and do at P, so setting our position again to, oh God, I don't remember. Is it, yeah, minpause and in brackets we do zero, which is our first input, input one. And then we do at P. So the position of our first input, that is what that means. So first, that's our first input. We're selecting our first input here and then we're selecting the attribute that we want to do a min pause for. 
and then we close over the semicolon. And now <laughs> we have our method. So in certain circumstances, this is better. But obviously in this one, it's a little weird, but it's also quite cool because if we go back here and do a merge, I don't know if I've talked about this either. I feel like I must have. But merge is, is brilliant. It's basically combining two different things. You can, com well, combining however many things. But as you can see, this is sticking right to the surface. But the velocity is sort of pushing things around, which is, is fucking things up. So, but I mean, I have used this method a few times. I'll show you something on screen where I used it. And it was for some hair or some points where I would copy hair to. But yeah, these two methods are probably your best bets for animating geometry. So thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. Any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.